Well, there's somebody here who needs this, so I'm going to ask you to say this all together with me. God surprises. Come on, everyone. God's surprises are better than my plans. Do you believe that? That's the truth. Because God will put you in places you never dreamed possible for you. Because God is a God of great creativity. He's amazing when it comes to taking people just like you, because I've I sat where you were a lot of years ago, and I can tell you that God has put me in places that I never dreamed possible, and it is miraculous, but you must wait upon the Lord. God's surprises are better than your plans. So somebody needs to lay down some plans and wait upon the Lord today. Now, that was free for nothing. Because today I really wanted to talk to you about, I think, something so critically important for all of us, and it comes from the mouth of Jesus. Now, I've come to understand, and I hope you do as well, come to understand that every word that comes from the mouth of Jesus is glorious. But some of his sayings are very hard to hear for us human beings. And today is one of those places because I want you to go to Matthew's Gospel, chapter five, in your Bible, and I'd like us to take a look at the Sermon on the Mount in one specific place, and I would like to, in the Sermon on the Mount, I wanna take you to the summit of the sermon. I want you to go to the place where the air is very rare, it's very thin up there, and and you're gonna be panting, and you're gonna be wanting to, uh, to breathe deeper, and you're gonna wonder, can I live in this rare atmosphere? But we're gonna go there anyway, because what Jesus is doing in the Sermon on the Mount is he's opening up to ordinary people just like us what the kingdom of God is all about. Many years I tried rock climbing. I don't know if anybody's ever tried that, but uh, I, tried it. I had a friend who was an expert climber, and he had the skill and enough gear to to take on the most challenging ascent. So after teaching me about uh, the basic techniques and safety measures of rock climbing, he took me to the base of a massive pinnacle that rose into the sky. I was filled with rookie pride, I will tell you that. I looked at the mountain from a distance and I thought, I got this, God, this is an easy climb. But when I finally got to the base and actually looked up, I realized that this was a mind bender of a climb. And there was no convenient ledges on which to stand. I'm thinking to myself, okay, I'm just gonna do mountain climbing. That means I'm going from boulder to boulder. I'm scrambling up the side of this mountain from ledge to ledge where I'll stand and wait and then I'll move on to the next. No, this was not that kind of a climb. It was a sheer rocky face with only a few cracks for handholds and some small rocky knobs that stuck out from the big flat iron that was the the face of the mountain on which your rubber boot, just the tip of your rubber boot or the edge of your rubber boot could catch a knob. I was standing at the bottom, quite honestly, I realized that my heart rate kind of was raising and, and my palms got sweaty all of a sudden. And actually my palms are getting sweaty just thinking of it right now. Because climbing a mountain like that is very different. Well, I'll tell you, I got all set up. He said, look, I'm gonna go ahead of you. I'm gonna set the pitons. You're gonna be tethered to me by a rope. You'll be okay. I said, fine, okay, let's go. So up I went and got through about half the climb. And then I got to one of those really difficult transition moments where I'm reaching all over the place and I cannot find a handhold. Meanwhile, my boots are just on an edge of a knob on the rocky face. And I got what they call, have you ever gotten a shot of adrenaline so, so much that your legs start to quiver in your muscles? They call it sewing machine legs. I got that. And I am in a sheer state of panic. And then I did something that I shouldn't have done. I looked down, <laughs> sheer panic as I looked down the side of this face, I thought for the first time, I could fall, and I'm wondering if this rope is gonna break my fall, 
And I went into this feeling, it was absolute sheer terror. Well, if you read the Sermon on the, by the way, I'll just tell you, I did make it up to the top. (laughs) Don't wanna keep you in suspense. But Jesus is taking ordinary people up the side of a very unfamiliar space. A mountain of God's kingdom heading toward a lofty summit. And on the way, he's stripping away something. He is stripping away all that rookie pride. All of that sense of self-righteousness. In fact, in the Sermon on the Mount, like no other place in all the Bible, Jesus is blistering the paint off of self-righteous people. Jesus is telling us that we don't need all that extra baggage to make the climb to the top. Jesus taught us two things before we even started that climb. He, and if you have your Bible open now to Matthew 5 verse 20, Jesus taught those people, and he's teaching us today, that the summit of God's righteousness is beyond our ability to reach by trying to be good. Verse 20, Jesus said, I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never, and he uses a double negative, it's not possible for you to enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, for everybody sitting there on that day, you have to understand that they were saying to themselves, well, wait a minute, these are the most religious people in our culture. These are the people that we all look to. They're the most righteous And if those people can't even get into the kingdom of heaven, how is it possible for me? Jesus was shocking them already. They were at the base of this mountain and they were already feeling. Now he goes on. The second thing he says, and this is most important, Jesus taught them that he would take them safely to the summit. How? Now listen carefully, by climbing it, not only before us, but climbing it for us. Look at verse 17. Jesus said, do not think that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Years ago when I sat where you are as a student, I came as I'll call a pretty green Christian. What I understood was that Jesus died on the cross for my sins, but what I did not understand is not only did Jesus pay the price for my sins, but he also lived a perfect life in my place. That I had no idea. I didn't understand that whole idea that Jesus actually would fulfill the law, not just for himself because he was the son of God, but he would actually fulfill the law for me. Every one of us is like an alien lamb. You know what happens uh, with an orphan lamb? Well, a good shepherd knows that there's a couple of ways to help that lamb be adopted. One way is if the ewe has a, their own lamb has died, they'll actually skin the dead lamb and they'll put it on the, the, the live lamb and they'll just kind of cover that lamb and the ewe will then take the scent and then will begin to nurse and take care of that little lamb. The other way is if the ewe is strong enough and has enough ability to feed two little lambs, what they'll do is a shepherd will take some of the water and the blood of the afterbirth and they'll smear it all over that other lamb. Now I want you to understand something. I'm speaking to you in a metaphor about your life in Christ. Jesus Christ has covered you with his righteousness. When John the Baptist saw Jesus, this is the first comment he makes about him. Behold, what? Go ahead, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That was his identity. That was his identity for you and for me. And so we're covered, the Bible says in a number of places in the Bible, we're covered by the Lamb of God. Second of all, the Bible speaks in 1 John chapter five of the water and the blood. The Bible speaks over and over again. Jesus died on the cross and from his side poured forth water and blood, and so the fact is I've I've had the blood of Jesus and and I've had that birth smeared all over me, that new birth, and so I've come into the family of God. What I didn't realize is that Jesus was actually gonna take me to the summit because Jesus himself is pure. Jesus is going to live the perfect life for me. He's the sinless son of God. 
Now what Jesus has been doing in the Sermon on the Mount is he's been teaching ordinary people about the law. And he's been teaching them uh, six comparisons. He'll say, you have heard that it is said, but I say to you. He does that six times. And he's doing it in each case to help them understand that there is a common understanding of the Old Testament law, but that they had it wrong, that they didn't understand it correctly. And so Jesus is trying to do something. He's actually trying to help us understand the depth of God's holiness. Literally what Jesus is doing is he is literally taking us behind the curtain of the Holy of Holies. He's helping us to look into the face of God. He's helping us understand it. And he begins in verse 21, he says, you've heard it said of those of old, you shall not murder, but whoever murders will be liable to judgment. He said, I say to you, whoever insults his brother, whoever calls him a fool will be liable to the, the, the fire of hell. And he goes on, you've, you've read these things, you've heard it said you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you, everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her. And he goes on and on and on, and what he's doing is he's helping us to understand that the law is not just external righteousness, it, there's something so deep about the law of God, about the holiness, holiness of God that we have come to misunderstand it. But now he's gonna take us to the summit because he does this six times and the last one, he pulls the curtain back and he shows us something that is only seen, listen, in the Bible and from the lips of Jesus. Verse 43, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven for he makes his sun to rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than the others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore, here it is, here's the summit, must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now let's go back and take a look at this. Because Jesus now contrasts what was said and understood in that culture with the way of God and the kingdom of God. It begins, you've heard it said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Now, you have to understand something about this. The Old Testament law never said hate your enemy. Do you know something? That's what the rabbis added. And just like today, as I was talking to Dr. Talley before this, uh, this session today, just like today, there are many preachers who will want to take the Bible and make it convenient or easier to hear because it will appeal to more people. So it was back then. The rabbis actually changed the law. They actually added to the law this tradition of, you have the right to hate your enemies. But nowhere in the Bible, does it say that? As a matter of fact, the law made it clear that you're not to take vengeance or bear even a grudge against the children of your people. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Leviticus 19.18. Proverbs 25.21. If your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink, and so forth. And so Jesus takes on this whole issue of hatred bluntly, and he repudiates it. You know, they considered their neighbor as their fellow Israelite or a proselyte Gentile who'd come into the Jewish faith. But if someone was a Samaritan or if someone was a dirty old Gentile, that was reason enough to hate him. And so when Jesus says, love your enemies, he is literally going to a place that no one else does. When I was here at Biola, my major was philosophy and I studied uh, religions and I studied philosophy and you will never find anyone else who voices this command, this principle, love your enemies. Do you realize something? That in Jesus Christ, we have come into a new kingdom. We are living in a new paradigm. This is not just, oh, I'm 
I'm sort of in the world, I'm sort of kind of, no, you are in the world but not of it, right? You're living in a new place. You're actually supposed to be different. You're supposed to be embracing what is different about it. And you're expected to be different in this world. We're to be different kind of people. Jesus said, you're to love your enemies. Jesus took on the whole issue of even who is my neighbor. Remember in John chapter four, Jesus and the Samaritan woman. Here was a woman who was not only a Samaritan, she was uh, living a lifestyle that, uh, that was very questionable. And the Bible tells us that Jesus had to go through Samaria. Well, the fact is, is that the Jews actually circumvented. They went around Samaria. They didn't go to Samaria because the Samaritans had no dealings with the Jews and the Jews with the Samaritans. They were different racially. They were different religiously. And yet the Bible tells us that Jesus goes and sits down with this woman, offers her living water. And then the, 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 the parable, or the story I should say, uh, of the good Samaritan who walked by that man who was beat up on the road. Well, it was first a, a priest and then comes along another religious man, a Levite, and they go, you know, I'm too busy today, I'm just getting, I, that's a mess. Along comes a Samaritan and he binds up his wounds. He puts him on his donkey. He takes him to an inn. He pays the man. He says, I'll come back and I'll pay you again. And Jesus said, well, who, who was the neighbor here? And so Jesus is breaking down barriers. You can just hear him tumbling. And when Jesus says these words, love your neighbor, he is just completely destroying all the construct of how the Jews thought then. And honestly, I have to tell you honestly, he's destroying our construct too. He's, he's taking down our self-righteousness. A lot of you uh, enter into what I'll call the blogospheres of today. And I, I read them, not often, but enough to know that Christians on blogs will trade insult for insult, cursing for cursing, as they, as they try to quote unquote defend the faith. Now it's okay to stand for truth, but it's not okay to trade insults or curses. We're the people in the world who when somebody curses you, you bless them back. When your enemies hate you, you love your enemies. We are a totally different people in this world. And it's so radical, it's so different, it's so godlike. How are we to love our enemies? Jesus said, pray for those who continually persecute you. You know, when you pray for your enemies, somehow the poison goes away. You notice that? If you've ever prayed for your enemies or prayed for someone and continued to pray for them, the poison would go away. I was in Ethiopia some years ago and teaching a pastor's conference and uh, some of the pastors had come, they'd walked sometimes two and three days. I looked down, some of them didn't even have shoes. I actually took a picture of their feet and thought how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news, all gnarled. And there they were standing there, and I knew that some of them, over 50 churches had just been burned to the ground. And these pastors had come to this conference. And I thought to myself, I'd love to know what they're saying in their small groups, because we broke out into small groups, and I just, they were talking, having, having tea together under a tree. And I went over and I asked somebody, I said, what are they talking about? Well, they're talking about the fact that their churches have been burned. I said, but tell me what they're, what they're saying. They're asking one another, listen, how can we love these people? How can we love these? If somebody burns your house down today, somebody burned down Biola, would you, would you think about how can we love these people? You see how radically different this is to be a follower of Jesus Christ? It is in a different world. Love your enemies. We're to, how are we to love them? We're to pray for them. One of the books I read when I came to Biola as a student years ago was the book, The Cost of Discipleship. If you don't have it, please get it. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a Christian pastor and a dissident who stood up against the brutality and anti-Semitism of Nazis Germany. In his book, he writes these words. There's a man who died just, just weeks before the closing of the war by hanging. 
but he, he wrote these words. Where is love more glorified than when she dwells in the midst of her enemies? Wow. First John chapter four, listen. Beloved, let us, not love one, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. Now there's three reasons that Jesus gives us here on why we ought to love our enemies. The first he says in verse 45, he says, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. One of the things about loving your enemies is it actually reveals who you are. Jesus said, if you, can, if you love your enemies, you actually reveal yourself to be in the kingdom of God, one of my children. You reveal yourself to be one, sons of the Father. Now, I know a lot of Christians who would go back to the Old Testament understanding of the rabbis and say, you know, I'll love my, my Christian friends, but those other people out there, they hate me, I hate them back. Jesus says, no. This is not how you're going to live your life. You're going to love your enemies. Do you know that uh, the, the church was under great persecution? We know that. After Christ died and rose again, early church starts. It's under tremendous pressure and persecution. Many are being killed and but it, within 300 years, what had happened? That great oppressor, oppressor, that government, Rome, was now dead. Christianity was very much alive. And they didn't do it with the sword. They did it by the power of God and the love of Jesus Christ. That power is still available to us today. That's what we're called to. That's the kingdom of God. The second thing that this... Uh, reveals is it reflects the heart of God for those who hate him. When we love our enemies, we're actually living out the very character of God who is holy. For he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good. He, God, sends rain on the just and the unjust, Jesus says. See, God is merciful even to his enemies. God is loving and he's careful and he's just to those who who hate him. The atheist is the recipient of God's beautiful creation, breathes God's pure air, he drinks God's water, he uh, eats the nourishing variety of foods that God created, he enjoys the blessing of life that God graciously gives so he can use his energy to curse God with every breath and hate God with every ounce of energy and deny God with every intellectual construct. All the while, God is loving that person. The heart of God is the heart to love enemies. Romans 5.8, some of you memorized this one when you were a little child. But God demonstrated his love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, what happened? Christ died for us, the greatest act of love ever. And so now you can see the fact that you are in a different space. You're in a different kingdom. Yes, there's the kingdom of this world, but there's the kingdom of God of which you are a part of, and I'm a part of, and it's very, very different. The third reason that Jesus gives in 46 and 47 is that it reminds us that we are a part uh, of a different world. He says, if you love like those who love you, what reward do you have? Even the tax collectors, those were the guys that were really despised. By the way, it's tax season, anybody? Do your taxes? I'm sure you did. Even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than the others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. And so Jesus is calling us out to a new life. Now, he's gonna take us to the summit next. In the next verse, he's gonna take us to the next place and he's gonna take us all the way to the top. When he says, now, be perfect even as your heavenly father is perfect. And every one of us honestly would say, I'm not there. That's why you need Jesus to take you to the top. That's why you need Jesus filling your life. Do you know why we don't love our enemies like we ought to? It's because there's too much of us and not enough of Christ in us. 
let's be honest. It's more of me and less of him. That's why I don't love like I should. But if you have the Lord Jesus Christ filling, absolutely filling your life, you will literally love your enemies like God loves them. Let me close with this. World War II, a Serbian bishop, Nikolai Velimirovic, spoke out against, com- uh, against Nazism in the 40s, and because of that he was arrested and taken to the prison at Dachau, a concentration camp. And there he began to write, and I want to read one of his prayers to you. Listen to this prayer. Bless my enemies, O Lord, even as I bless them and do not curse them. Enemies have driven me into your embrace more than my friends have. Friends have bound me to earth, enemies have loosed me from earth and have demolished all my aspirations in the world. Just as a hunted animal finds safer shelter than an unhunted animal does, so have I. Persecuted by enemies, I've found the safest sanctuary having ensconced myself beneath your tabernacle where neither friends nor enemies can slay my soul. Bless my enemies, O Lord, even as I bless and do not curse them. Wow. A man in a concentration camp for the cause of Christ. Now, I'm gonna ask you to do something as we close. I'm gonna ask you to stand right where you are. And I'm gonna ask you to put into practice if God will give you the grace to do so right now. I'm gonna ask you to do something. I'm gonna ask you to actually practice what Jesus has just taught you. If he is your savior and he is your Lord and master and you know he's the son of God, then you'll be wanting to embrace this and step into this moment of his kingdom. You'll want to go to the summit with him on this. I'm gonna ask you to do something. I'm gonna ask you to pray for on a blessing on your enemy. I want you to think about the person who hates you. I want you to think about the people who've uh, persecuted you, who said evil things about you. It may be a family member, maybe somebody in your neighborhood, may be somebody of another race, may be somebody of another social class, may be somebody who stole from you, somebody who said something about you, slandered you. The Holy Spirit will show you. Who is your greatest enemy? Now, bow your heads. In quietness, I want you to pray a blessing on them and obey Jesus and love your enemies. Pray for their soul. Pray that maybe if they're not a believer, they will come to faith in Jesus. Pray a blessing on them. Do what Jesus has said. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles, with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.